This is Anesthesia Rounds, a series of discussions of clinical problems confronting the anesthesiologist. This discussion deals with the role of the heart in shock. Principally, it centers on these questions. Does the heart play a significant role in the initiation and development of shock? To what degree is the heart involved? Discussing these questions are Drs. Arthur C. Guyton and Jack W. Crowell. Dr. Guyton is professor and chairman of the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at the University of Mississippi in Jackson. Dr. Crowell is an associate professor in the same department. In analyzing a number of critical aspects of shock, Drs. Guyton and Crowell will also consider such questions as the following. The factors that regulate cardiac output in health and in shock. Also, those factors that underlie cardiac deterioration. Then, hemorrhagic shock. The relationships between venous pressure, capillary permeability, blood volume, and cardiac output. They will also consider the relationship between hemodynamic and metabolic factors in shock. And finally, they will discuss various approaches to management of shock. Anesthesia Rounds is presented as a service to clinicians in the field of anesthesiology by AIRST Laboratories. Dr. Guyton, Dr. Kroll, in our discussion of the role of the heart in shock, may we begin by asking you, Dr. Guyton, to discuss the factors that normally regulate cardiac output. These factors are quite different from what most people believe. Many physicians believe that the heart itself regulates cardiac output, but this is rarely the case. Only when the heart is in a very serious condition does it play a major role in regulating output. So I'll begin by listing the three principal factors that require discussion when we talk about the regulation of cardiac output. The first is the heart itself, obviously. The second is the resistance to the flow of blood through the various tissues of the body. And the third is the degree to which the circulatory system is filled with blood. Let's talk about the heart first. At rest, it has the ability to pump 10 to 15 liters of blood per minute, but usually it pumps only about five. Now that means there's a lot of reserve capacity, the so-called cardiac reserve. If the heart should become stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system, then it can pump as much as 25 to 30 liters per minute. In an athlete, incidentally, this volume can go up to 35 or perhaps even 40 liters per minute. Now you see that this stimulating ability of the sympathetic nervous system provides a great deal of additional reserve. Yet at rest, cardiac output is still only about 5 liters. For these reasons, the heart actually acts very much like a sump pump, which is a rather peculiar description. But the heart is in the chest, which we might call the sump. Whenever blood flows in, the heart simply pumps it on out. This was the basic principle that Starling pointed out some 60 years ago, Starling's law of the heart. Other people before Starling had talked about it too. We have known for some time that the heart has a very large reserve. How would you characterize the role of the heart with respect to the regulation of output under normal conditions, Dr. Guyton? I like to say that the heart sets a permissive level of regulation. The normal permissive level as we're sitting here now, is about 12, 13 liters per minute. This means that cardiac output can be regulated at any value between zero and this upper limit of 12 to 13 liters per minute. The heart plays the role of providing a motive power, and it usually sets this power level quite a bit higher than is actually required. When you exercise, you may need as much as 20 liters per minute. The normal heart, again at rest, doesn't have that much capability. But in exercise, nerve impulses transmitted by way of the sympathetic nervous system will set the permissive level to 25 or 30 liters, even though only 20 liters per minute are required. Now that's the way the heart works. You can see that in normal operation, it is capable of pumping much more blood than is required and is not the factor that determines the amount that is actually pumped. But if the heart becomes greatly weakened, its permissive level of output regulation falls and may even fall below the level required by the body. Under these conditions, it is the heart that becomes the limiting factor in the control of cardiac output. 
If not the heart then, what does normally regulate the cardiac output? The answer to this is essentially all the tissues of the body. Every tissue has its own basic self-regulatory mechanism for controlling the flow of blood through itself. For instance, the muscles. When you're not exercising, blood flow through the muscles is really quite small. Only 20 to 25 percent of the total blood flow goes through all the muscles, even though these tissues account for 40 to 50 percent of the body's total mass. But during heavy exercise, the flow of blood through a given muscle can increase as much as 20-fold. The activity automatically increases the flow through that particular muscle. This is true, by the way, even in the absence of any other control factors in the body. Control is occurring directly in the muscle itself. In the same way, the flow of blood through the kidneys is controlled by local factors in the kidney, mainly the need for excreting salt, other electrolytes, and waste products. In the skin, the blood flow is controlled primarily by the body's need to control temperature. And flow through the brain is controlled to a great extent by that organ's need to get rid of carbon dioxide. So it is carbon dioxide in the fluids of the brain that controls the blood flow. Does it follow then that cardiac output is equivalent to the aggregate of all these tissue flows? The flow through the muscles, through the viscera, through the brain, and through the skin, add them up and the sum equals cardiac output. In reality, therefore, cardiac output is normally controlled almost entirely by the total action of all the tissues. They regulate the flow to the amount they require, and if the heart can pump that amount, it will do so. These tissues open up their vessels and let the blood through, let it into the veins, and the surge of blood flowing into the heart is pumped in turn right on back into the arteries, if the heart is capable of doing so. And we've already pointed out that the normal heart is capable of doing that pumping job because it has this cardiac reserve. What is the relative significance of the third control factor in cardiac output? the degree to which the circulatory system is filled with blood. If the system is only lightly filled, it can pump only a small amount of blood. The reason for this is that we must build up enough pressure in our peripheral vessels to push the blood back through the veins to the heart. If the heart should begin to pump harder than is normal, or if it should try to pump more blood than is actually flowing into it, the veins would simply collapse. And you'd be surprised how many of our veins are collapsed as we're sitting here right now. The veins in the neck are collapsed, for example. And similarly, those that go through the abdomen with the viscera compressing them are generally in a semi-collapsed state. However, if the pressure of the blood in the more peripheral veins is high enough, the blood can push its way through the collapsed veins. And whatever amount can push through these collapsed veins is the amount the heart will pump. The more blood you have in the circulation, the more blood can be pushed through these veins, can open them up and get into the heart. Yet this is not one of the normal means by which cardiac output is controlled, because our blood volume usually does not increase and decrease moment by moment. Normal regulation of cardiac output is determined more by the resistance to flow through the periphery than by the volume of blood in the system. The reason I mention blood volume is that it plays a major role in shock. Also, it plays a major role when a person is overtransfused. When there isn't sufficient volume, the blood will not come back from these peripheral vessels and through the central veins into the heart. Therefore, volume plays a very important role in abnormal conditions, even though it doesn't play too much of a role under normal circumstances. I think that provides a very brief summary of the fundamental factors that regulate cardiac output, and I believe they will provide a basis for discussion of the other factors we have before us. Dr. Kroll, what role do these three regulatory factors play in shock? As Dr. Guyton pointed out, the fluid component is not normally a regulating factor. But hemorrhagic shock is initiated by a reduction of the blood volume which means, in effect, limiting the output of the heart. 
Later on, this blood is reinfused. But no one has ever produced data that really tells us whether the blood volume is normal or abnormal. This is because the circulation has deteriorated and none of the basic measuring tests are considered accurate. I would like to exclude the question of blood volume because we have performed experiments with animals in which blood was given in such quantity that no possible lack of fluid could have occurred. Hit shock did occur and the animals died. Of the other factors, the power of the tissues to regulate output is a very important one because we find that when the tissues are in need of oxygen, for example, after a long period of hypertension, the regulatory system has opened the vessels and the cardiac output can be extremely high. It normally is not, however, because to achieve high cardiac outputs, the arterial pressure would have to be at a normal level, and quite frequently, this does not occur. If the arterial pressure is brought to a high level for at least a short period of time, there is a very high cardiac output, but usually the pressure drops after a while and the oxygenation of the tissues is decreased. Not necessarily because they are using less oxygen, but simply because they can't get it. Discussing this from the standpoint of the heart, in the beginning the heart is normal, of course, and it can tolerate quite an hypoxic insult. If it is maintained at this particular hypoxic level, it begins to use up its reservoirs of energy and it will begin to deteriorate. At what point in the shock cycle is the heart compromised? Everyone agrees that terminally the heart is in failure. But there is a great deal of argument as to exactly when this failure begins. In other words, does it begin during the hypotensive phase or is it something that happens very near the end of the shock period? As Dr. Guyton pointed out, the heart has a great deal of reserve, and if one measures simply the parameters of the heart as it is functioning in shock, he will find that quite often they are within normal limits, but usually on the very low side of these limits. On the other hand, if we test the heart to its full capacity during the entire period of hypertension, and the progressive phase of shock, we find that the deterioration begins at approximately the same time the experimental animal begins to need blood to maintain whatever pressure the experiment is designed for. Thus, when there is evidence that the dog's circulation is deteriorating, there is also evidence that the heart is deteriorating. And if measurements are made continually from this point on, progressive deterioration of the heart can be found. It does not always become evident that the heart is deteriorating until later when the heart is not pumping sufficient blood, yet the atrial pressure is still high. Would you like to comment on that, Dr. Guyton? I'd like to add one additional factor that I think is quite important. In our laboratory recently, we had a Japanese investigator, Dr. Suniaki Sugimoto, who studied the maximum amount of blood that the heart could pump at different coronary arterial pressures. Dr. Sugimoto controlled the pressure that was used to perfuse the coronary vessels, beginning at 100 millimeters of mercury, then dropped it to 90, then to 80, then to 70, and so forth. He studied how long it would take for the pumping of the blood from the heart to begin to fade from its normal level after he had dropped the coronary perfusing pressure from its normal level down to one of these low values. It was very interesting to see that you could tell within five minutes that maximum pumping of blood from the heart was beginning to deteriorate, and that after 10 minutes of 70 millimeters of mercury coronary arterial pressure, the pumping ability of the heart had already decreased some 20%. When you drop the pressure to 40 millimeters of mercury, the pumping ability decreased to approximately one half normal in about 45 minutes. Now this seems to suggest that the heart was deteriorating very rapidly. In fact, that's what I say was happening. But if you had studied the entire circulation of that animal during these same experiments, it would have been almost impossible to show that the heart was pumping any less 
than its normal cardiac output. Could you elaborate that point, Dr. Guyton? In these experiments, Dr. Sugimoto always tested to see how much the heart could pump. He did this by momentarily infusing large quantities of blood into the right atrium and checking to see how hard that heart could pump for just a few seconds. It was always able to pump a large amount of blood, much more than the required cardiac output. At the beginning of the experiment, the heart was capable of pumping four times as much blood as the animal needed. And after an hour, it was still able to pump twice as much blood as the animal needed. Now, would you call that cardiac deterioration or not? I would like to say that it is. And yet cardiac output had not fallen below normal during all this time. So simple cardiac output measurements were not able at all to show deterioration of the heart. Just as Dr. Crowell pointed out a few minutes ago, once you can see the cardiac output falling, it is evident that the heart has deteriorated to far below its normal capacity. In other words, all the cardiac reserve has been used up by then. The heart is pretty close to being exhausted by this time. Dr. Guyton, what elements enter into the deterioration of the heart itself with low output? I think Dr. Crawl should discuss that in detail because he has been studying it in his own laboratory. I will simply mention that many of us have thought for a long time that whenever cardiac output and arterial pressure fall, the lack of blood flow to the heart limits the nutrition of the heart itself, and that this leads to a feedback that can become a vicious cycle and cause cardiac deterioration. But Dr. Kroll has a great deal of specific information on this, so I would like to turn it over to him. If one examines all the functions of blood flow, you will find if the flow to a tissue is progressively decreased, that the first function affected is oxygen transport. While glucose, for example, can be transported adequately at one-tenth of normal cardiac output, oxygen is usually restricted by any output less than one-half of normal. In other words, if cardiac output decreases to one-third or one-half of normal, it becomes physically impossible for enough oxygen to be transported so that the minimal functions of the tissues can be carried out. Thus, it would appear that the flow-limiting factor is an oxygen transport, oxygen being one of the nutrients. With decreased flow, the tissues become hypoxic and are unable to sustain all of the metabolic functions which are necessary for cell survival. I might also add that the rate of hypoxia is not really the determinant here, although it is important. The cell can withstand a one-half normal oxygen rate for quite a while but it is the integral, or total oxygen, debt that will eventually cause irreversible cellular changes. Dr. Kroll, how does the oxygen debt lead to the metabolic disturbances that, in turn, cause shock? First, the oxygen debt might be called the transition between the hemodynamic and metabolic aspects of shock. Since the oxygen debt is created by inadequate circulation, the question that arises is what function of the cell would be changed in proportion to this deficit. For one thing, it is known that anaerobic metabolism occurs in proportion to the absence of aerobic metabolism. And in fact, one of the diagnostic criteria now used to determine the degree of shock is the amount of lactic acid created by anaerobic metabolism. However, this is not the irreversible change I mentioned earlier. When one looks at the energy system, he finds a decoupling mechanism utilizing energy derived from food and transported to purine bases, which in this case are ATP, ADP, AMP, and so on. In other words, energy is added to the system, thus changing compounds from those with lower to those with higher caloric values. Conversely, the systems using energy take it by degrading these compounds from ATP to ADP and on to adenosine. Normally, of course, these energy systems are in equilibrium. However, if the energy supplying system becomes limited, 
as it would if adequate oxygen were not available. Then the rate of ATP restoration is limited, and the amount of unrestored ATP, or the amount of intermediates present within the cell, increase in proportion to the oxygen debt, and, of course, at a rate proportional to the oxygen decrease. As adenosine and inosine are formed, they leave the cell, as has been shown many times by Warburg studies. If oxygen is restored, they will re-enter and be reconverted to ATP. What happens, Dr. Curl, if the oxygen debt is not repaid within a given period? Taking the same situation in an animal, once these compounds leave the cell, they are immediately in the catabolic system, which carries adenosine through several stages to hypoxanthine. One can still recover the compound from hypoxanthine because there are pathways from it all the way back to ATP. However, if hypoxanthine remains in the catabolic system for even a short while, it is converted irreversibly to xanthine and then to uric acid by xanthine oxidase. Once this conversion has occurred, it is not possible for the body to restore ATP, even if oxygen is readmitted to the tissues. We believe, therefore, that this is the metabolic mechanism through which shock occurs, shock being defined in this case as a product of cells with an inadequate energy source, and that shock becomes irreversible when so much energy base has been lost irreversibly to uric acid that there is no possibility of restoring ATP, even with restoration of oxygen. Thus, this is a general cellular condition affecting all cells subjected to hypoxia. The only real question that remains is, which tissues would be affected first in a way that would cause the death of the animal? Dr. Kroll, is there a procedure that would permit blocking of the catabolic pathway so that irreversible loss an irreversible shock could be averted? Yes. The compounds are reversible as long as they are at or above the level of hypoxanthine. Therefore, if the pathway from hypoxanthine to uric acid is blocked, the energy-based compounds will not be lost. We have tried blocking this pathway. The enzyme that controls the reaction that leads from hypoxanthine to xanthine and thence to uric acid the xanthine oxidase, and if an antimetabolite, in this case allopyranol, xylopram, is used, this pathway can be blocked. Once it is blocked, the investigator finds that even though a dog is subjected to a far greater stimulus than normally occurs with a control dog, shock is usually not irreversible. It is in shock true, but when blood is returned, the animal resynthesizes his energy compounds, and after a while, the pressure returns to normal. By the next day, usually, the dog is within normal limits. Dr. Guyton, what might be the role of the heart in relation to the other portion of the circulatory system in the causation of what has been called irreversible shock? This is probably the most important question we have to answer today, because if shock continues long enough, the heart as all other parts of the body, can deteriorate itself because of lack of a nutrient supply. The question, therefore, is what part of the circuitry is it that deteriorates first? And here we have to hedge somewhat because there are a lot of different types of shock, a lot of different causes of shock. I'd like to begin with two extremes in discussing this. The first is what we call cardiogenic shock in which the heart itself is the initiating cause of the shock. In other words, the heart has had a myocardial infarction or another equally abnormal insult that has caused it to pump blood far less easily than usual. The shock is then caused by a weak heart. Under these conditions, it's almost axiomatic that the heart will deteriorate even more. Or we can take a situation in which a patient is in shock on the operating table for only a few hours. He survives the operation perfectly well, but he dies a week or so later of renal failure. Under these conditions, we have renal failure as the primary cause of death. The heart has recovered perfectly well, 
and yet here was an irreversible state. The difficulty is that people don't generally call this irreversible shock. They call this death from anuria, but the anuria was the result of the shock. What about shock cases that fall between the two extremes? Let's consider the great in-between, the usual patient with hemorrhagic shock who never comes out of the shock but goes downhill continually to death. This is a condition we in our laboratory, and in Dr. Crawl's laboratory also, have studied extensively to try to, to determine when the different parts of the circulatory system become damaged severely enough to become the cause of an irreversible state. We can state that almost invariably, under these conditions, simple fluid therapy alone can raise the atrial pressure to a value high enough so that a normal heart could pump a normal cardiac output. In other words, right up to the point of death, we can bring the venous return back to normal. Consequently, we cannot say that it is an abnormal venous return that leads to irreversibility. But under these conditions, can the heart pump the blood offered to it? With cardiac output measurements, we find that the heart simply cannot pump the blood adequately. Now that's the basis of the statement that we've made a number of times, that in the usual type of slowly deteriorating hemorrhagic shock, it is primarily the heart itself that becomes the irreversible factor. We never like to state that other parts of the circulation may not be deteriorating at the same time. We know, for instance, that peripheral vessels too frequently are dilated by this time. But this is not lethal. You can very easily fill the peripheral circulation with extra volume. We found also that there might be some increased leakage from the circulatory system. But here again, in general, enough fluid therapy can keep the pressure at the input side of the heart high enough for it to function perfectly normally, if it can function. I keep coming back to the same statement, that in critical measurements of the functional ability of the heart at this point, we have found that despite a high enough venous pressure, the heart simply cannot pump enough blood. Dr. Crowell, what have you found to be the relationship between venous pressure, blood volume, and cardiac output in hemorrhagic shock? If one tries to increase cardiac output to normal by fluid infusion, the atrial pressures will usually rise above normal. When this happens, it appears that factors in the circulation then tend to lower atrial pressure toward normal, thereby decreasing the heart's output. Since the heart is not pumping normally, each time the atrial pressure is restored to normal, the cardiac output is low. Dr. Kroll, I think there's one other point we should make here, and that is, even the normal circulatory system will leak very, very rapidly if you overload it. In experiments that Mr. John Prather and I are doing in our laboratories right now, he infuses several liters of balanced electrolyte solution into animals over a period of one hour. And by the time he has infused this fluid, most of it has already leaked out of the circulation. He has similarly infused whole blood into animals, large quantities of it. But before he can complete his transfusion, a major share of the plasma portion of the blood has leaked out of the circulation. So the fact that a large quantity of fluid leaks out as the shock patient is treated does not mean that the peripheral circulatory system is necessarily abnormal. Dr. Kroll just pointed out that in order to make the heart pump a, a normal quantity of blood per minute, you have to raise the venous pressure far above normal. And it's under these very high venous pressures that even a normal circulation will leak large quantities of fluid, particularly plasma. This has been an argument that many people have used in the past, that the primary damage in shock is this terrific leakage of fluid. But the experimental evidence indicates that it's the very weak heart and very high venous pressure required to make this heart pump that causes the leakage, rather than damage in the peripheral circulatory system itself. At least this is what we have to believe at present until someone can prove something else.
which brings us to the question of whether there are general patterns of therapeutic approach for the patient who is in shock with heart failure. In some of the experiments in which oxygen debt was measured and used as a parameter, we did find that digitalization of the heart would allow the body to recover from a greater than normal insult. For this procedure to work, however, immediate digitalization is required. In other words, intravenous wabane, so that digitalization can be effected within a very short time. Digitalization must be very rapid and combined with restoration of blood volume and other supportive measures. It would appear from our present experiments that within a short time, we may be able to use this metabolic mechanism in the treatment of shock. However, the experiments at the present time are incomplete. The metabolic approach being a blockage of hypoxanthine oxidation. You might call it an attempt to restore the compounds which have been lost. Theoretically, it can be done. Is there a preferred means for determining the effectiveness of therapy? And is there a way to determine how well one is doing while he is busy doing it? You mean during the course of shock itself? During shock itself. A procedure that many clinicians are using, and one which I think is valid, involves the measurement of central venous pressure. Dr. Crowell found out a while ago that if you attempt to keep the cardiac output up to normal, you usually have to give quite an excess of fluids to the patient or animal, which means that the central venous pressure will rise above normal if the heart is weak. When the heart is normal, you can simply maintain your venous pressure at zero millimeters of mercury, or plus one or two millimeters, which is in the normal range, and the heart will pump all the blood that's needed. If the heart has become weakened, though, the central venous pressure will have to be elevated above these values in order to produce an adequate cardiac output. In a sense, you're inducing congestion, aren't you? Yes, in a sense, you are inducing systemic congestion. You have a back pressure on the system of veins, which is going to cause further leakage of fluid. Nevertheless, it's a very good diagnostic procedure to measure the central venous pressure during the course of shock. Another very good procedure for determining the effectiveness of therapy is to measure the oxygen content of venous blood because it is the most sensitive parameter of changes in blood flow. Of course, the measurement we would like to use would be cardiac output itself. But we have never worked out a feasible procedure for making such a determination from moment to moment in a very sick patient. It has been done on an experimental basis where people have had tremendous amounts of equipment and were able to take the measurements without disturbing the patient too much. But something much simpler than this is needed as a clinical tool. In measuring the oxygen content on the venous side, is it essential that one have direct information concerning the oxygen content on the arterial side, or can this be deduced from other factors? If the ventilation is satisfactory, the arterial concentration will usually be normal. Of course, it can always be measured. One should keep in mind that with normal oxygen saturation of the arterial blood, the tissues continue to receive as much oxygen as they previously did, even if cardiac output decreases. They do so by removing a higher than normal percentage of the oxygen from the arterial blood. This is what makes the determination of venous oxygen content the simplest of all procedures for detecting a decrease in cardiac output. Dr. Guyton, what are the normal compensatory mechanisms that prevent shock from following hemorrhage? In answering this question, I'll first give a few values as to how much hemorrhage a person can stand before shock will occur. Ordinarily, you can bleed a person or an animal 10 to 15 percent of his blood volume in a very few minutes without causing even a perceptible degree of shock. But if you get beyond the 20% mark, and particularly beyond 25 to 30% in the short period of time, a great majority of animals suffer very severe shock. If an animal or a person were bled very slowly over a period of hours, however, as much as 40 to 50% of the blood volume could be removed without causing shock. So now we need to say why it is that you can remove so much blood from the circulation without the development 
of a too low cardiac output and arterial pressure. Shock is related primarily to low flow, not to low pressure. Consequently, we need to talk primarily about the compensatory mechanisms which can maintain an adequate cardiac output despite removal of blood. Earlier in our discussion of the factors regulating cardiac output, we stated that the filling of the system is an abnormal factor that affects cardiac output in hemorrhage. You have removed a major share of the filling of the system. Therefore, we must call upon some of our other mechanisms to compensate for this removal of the filling. The first is the autonomic nervous system, and particularly the sympathetic portion of this system. At first, the lack of blood arriving at the heart causes the cardiac output to fall very slightly, which makes the arterial pressure fall slightly in turn. This sets off a series of reflexes, primarily the aortic and carotid body baroreceptor reflexes. Thus, if the arterial pressure falls to a low point, these receptors transmit signals to the brain and thence back to the circulatory system, primarily to activate the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic stimulation all through the body then causes vasoconstriction of the veins. If the veins, which hold the great bulk of the circulatory system's blood, can be constricted, the capacity of the circulation itself can be decreased down to a value consistent with the available blood down to a limit somewhere in the order of 75 to 80 percent of normal blood volume. What happens if blood volume falls still lower? Well, if more blood than that is removed and cardiac output does fall low, then some accessory compensatory mechanisms can come into play. With shock, normally the capillary pressures are lower than normal. We have about 12 liters of fluid in all of our tissue spaces, and if the pressure in the capillaries ever falls too low, the osmotic pressure generated by the proteins in the blood will promote osmosis through the capillary membranes, pulling a large amount of fluid that has been stored in the interstitial spaces into the blood. Because of this mechanism, we can replenish our blood volume by as much as a liter in a period of one hour. It's a rather slow mechanism, so consequently, it's of major value when the patient bleeds slowly. Another mechanism is that of reverse stress relaxation. This means that if ever you remove a large quantity of blood from some of the vascular reservoirs, such as the veins in the skin or abdomen or the venous sinuses of the liver or spleen, the veins themselves gradually creep to a smaller size. And this occurs even without sympathetic stimulation. The phenomenon has a fast component that occurs within five to 10 minutes and a very slow component that keeps going literally for hours. Therefore, if a person bleeds very slowly, the circulatory system can contract to smaller and smaller sizes and a smaller quantity of blood may still be adequate to fill the contracted circulatory system. These are some of the mechanisms that play a major role, and you will note that thus far I have not mentioned the heart at all. The reason is that the heart has an extra reserve, as I pointed out before. Stimulating the heart to an extra effort at this point will not be of particular value. However, if the shock continues into its late stages, into the stages where the heart begins to be compromised, sympathetic stimulation of the heart itself can then play a role in compensating for further deterioration of the circulation. Dr. Guyton, is the treatment of shock defined in a sense by the stage of shock? Before we can talk about that, I think we need to define briefly the different stages of shock. Many people refer to three stages, compensated shock, progressive shock, and irreversible shock. And there are many different definitions of each of these stages. To me, the compensated stage of shock means that even if you did nothing for the patient, he would recover, that he has enough compensations built into his body to combat the shock successfully 
despite the fact that he is still in it. The progressive stage of shock means to me that without therapy, the patient will go all the way to death. The irreversible stage of shock means to me that with all our current knowledge of therapeutics and application of these therapeutics, the patient still cannot be saved. Other people have other definitions for irreversible shock based on certain types of animal models of shock. But to me, irreversible simply means irreversible. Of course, it should be remembered that each time we find a new type of therapy that can prolong the patient's life, that means that those patients who once would have been in irreversible shock are now in progressive shock and can be saved by therapy. In general, it is impossible to tell which stage of shock a patient is in, except in retrospect, which means that treatment of the patient is very much the same regardless of stage. It is true that a good clinician can tell whether a patient is in very severe shock or in a milder phase. Often he can get by with very much less therapy because of this. But on the other hand, it's generally best to keep in mind that you can be fooled tremendously and that the best way to approach management is to treat all patients with pretty much the same philosophy. It doesn't mean that you load up every patient with excessive fluid nor that you necessarily use digitalis or some of the other forms of treatment. It does mean that if progressive measurements during the course of shock show that deterioration is taking place, you should be ready to use these procedures. If central venous pressure is rising, it's certainly good therapy to think in terms of digitalization. If central venous oxygen is falling to the vanishing point, it's good to think of getting the hemodynamic factors up to promote an adequate cardiac output. Therefore, a physician can tell, to some extent, the various degrees of shock. Nevertheless, the basic philosophy should still call for the maintenance of an adequate perfusion of the tissues to keep them from dying. Thank you, Dr. Guyton, and thank you, Dr. Kral, for your participation in this very informative discussion. Anesthesia Rounds has been presented as a service to clinicians in the field of anesthesiology by Airst Laboratories.